Kaczynski, Chapter 7 But these are all golden dreams. Oh, tell me, who was it first announced, who was it first proclaimed, that man only does nasty things because he does not know his own interests, and that if he were enlightened, if his eyes were opened to his real normal interests, man would at once cease to do nasty things, would at once become good and noble, because, being enlightened and understanding his real advantage, he would see his own advantage in the good and nothing else. And we all know that not one man can, consciously, act against his own interests. Consequently, so to say through necessity, he would begin doing good. Oh, the babe! Oh, the pure, innocent child! Why, in the first place, when, in all these thousands of years, has there been a time when man has acted only from his own interest? What is to be done with the millions of facts that bear witness that men, consciously, that is, fully understanding their real interests, have left them in the background and have rushed headlong on another path, to meet peril and danger, compelled to this course by nobody and by nothing, but, as it were, simply disliking the beaten track, and have obstinately, willfully struck out another difficult, absurd way, seeking it almost in the darkness. So, I suppose, this obstinacy and perversity were pleasanter to them than any advantage. Advantage! What is advantage? And will you take it upon yourself to define with perfect accuracy in what the advantage of man consists? And what if it so happens that a man's advantage sometimes not only may, but even must, consist in his desiring in certain cases what is harmful to himself and not advantageous? And if so, if there can be such a case, the whole principle falls into dust. What do you think? Are there any such cases? You laugh. Well, laugh away, gentlemen. But only answer me. Have man's advantages been reckoned up with perfect certainty? Are there not some which not only have not been included, but cannot possibly be included under any classification? You see, you gentlemen have, to the best of my knowledge, taken your whole register of human advantages from the averages of statistical figures and politico-economical formulas. Your advantages are prosperity, wealth, freedom, peace, and so on, and so on. So that the man who should, for instance, go openly and knowingly in opposition to all that list, would to your thinking, and indeed mine too, of course, be an obscurantist or an absolute madman. Would not he? But you know, this is what is surprising. Why does it so happen that all these statisticians, sages, and lovers of humanity, when they reckon up human advantages, invariably leave out one? They don't even take it into their reckoning in the form in which it should be taken, and the whole reckoning depends upon that. It would be no greater matter. They would simply have to take it, this advantage, and add it to the list. But the trouble is that this strange advantage does not fall under any classification and is not in place in any list. I have a friend, for instance. <laughs> Gentlemen, but of course he is your friend too, and indeed there is no one, no one to whom he is not a friend. When he prepares for any undertaking, this gentleman immediately explains to you, elegantly and clearly, exactly how he must act in accordance with the laws of reason and truth. What is more, he will talk to you with excitement and passion of the true normal interests of man. With irony he will upbraid the short-sighted fools who do not understand their own interests, nor the true significance of virtue. And within a quarter of an hour, without any sudden outside provocation, but simply through something inside him which is stronger than all his interests, he will go off on quite a different tack. That is, act in direct opposition to what he has just been saying about himself, in opposition to the laws of reason, in opposition to his own advantage, in fact, in opposition to everything. 
I warn you that my friend is a compound personality, and therefore it is difficult to blame him as an individual. The fact is, gentlemen, it seems there really must exist something that is dearer to almost every man than his greatest advantages. Or, not to be illogical, there is a most advantageous advantage, the very one omitted of which we spoke just now, which is more important and more advantageous than all other advantages, for the sake of which a man, if necessary, is ready to act in opposition to all laws, that is, in opposition to reason, honor, peace, prosperity, in fact, in opposition to all those excellent and useful things, if only he can attain that fundamental, most advantageous advantage which is dearer to him than all. Yes, but it's advantage all the same, you will retort. But excuse me, I'll make the point clear, and it is not a case of playing upon words. What matters is that this advantage is remarkable from the very fact that it breaks down all our classifications and continually shatters every system constructed by lovers of mankind for the benefit of mankind. In fact, it upsets everything. But before I mention this advantage to you, I want to compromise myself personally, and therefore I boldly declare that all these fine systems, all these theories for explaining to mankind their real normal interests, in order that inevitably striving to pursue these interests they may at once become good and noble, are, in my opinion, so far mere logical exercises. Yes, logical exercises. Why, to maintain this theory of the regeneration of mankind by means of the pursuit of his own advantage is to my mind almost the same thing as to affirm, for instance, following Buckle, that through civilization mankind becomes softer and consequently less bloodthirsty and less fitted for warfare. Logically, it does seem to follow from his arguments. But man has such a predilection for systems and abstract deductions that he is ready to distort the truth intentionally. He is ready to deny the evidence of his senses only to justify his logic. I take this example because it is the most glaring instance of it. Only look about you. Blood is being spilt in streams, and in the merriest way, as though it were champagne. Take the whole of the nineteenth century in which Buckle lived. Take Napoleon, the great and also the present one. Take North America, the eternal union. Take the farce of Schleswig-Holstein, and what is it that civilization softens in us? The only gain of civilization for mankind is the greater capacity for variety of sensations, and absolutely nothing more. And through the development of this many-sidedness, man may come to finding enjoyment in bloodshed. In fact, this has already happened to him. Have you noticed that it is the most civilized gentlemen who have been the subtlest slaughterers? to whom the Attilas and Stenkarajins could not hold a candle, and if they are not so conspicuous as the Attilas and Stenkarajins, it is simply because they are so often met with, are so ordinary, and have become so familiar to us. In any case, civilization has made mankind, if not more bloodthirsty, at least more vilely, more loathsomely bloodthirsty. In old days he saw justice in bloodshed, and with his conscience at peace exterminated those he thought proper. Now we do think bloodshed abominable, and yet we engage in this abomination, and with more energy than ever. Which is worse? Decide that for yourselves. They say that Cleopatra, excuse an instance from Roman history, was fond of sticking gold pins into her slave girl's breasts, and derived gratification from their screams and writhings. You will say that this was in the comparatively barbarous times, that these are barbarous times too, because also, comparatively speaking, pins are stuck in even now, that though man has now learned to see more clearly than in barbarous ages, he is still far from having learnt to act as reason and science would dictate. 
but yet you are fully convinced that he will be sure to learn when he gets rid of certain old bad habits, and when common sense and science have completely re-educated human nature and turned it in a normal direction. You are confident that then man will cease from intentional error and will, so to say, be compelled not to want to set his will against his normal interests. That is not all. Then, you say, science itself will teach man, though to my mind it's a superfluous luxury, that he never has really had any caprice or will of his own, and that he himself is something of the nature of a piano key or the stop of an organ, and that there are, besides, things called the laws of nature, so that everything he does is not done by his willing it, but is done of itself by the laws of nature. Consequently, we have only to discover these laws of nature, and man will no longer have to answer for his actions, and life will become exceedingly easy for him. All human actions will then, of course, be tabulated according to these laws, mathematically, like tables of logarithms up to 108,000, and entered in an index. Or better still, there would be published certain edifying works of the nature of encyclopedic lexicons in which everything will be so clearly calculated and explained that there will be no more incidents or adventures in the world. Then, this is all what you say, new economic relations will be established, all ready-made and worked out with mathematical exactitude, so that every possible question will vanish in the twinkling of an eye, simply because every possible answer to it will be provided. Then the palace of crystal will be built. Then, in fact, those will be halcyon days. Of course, there is no guaranteeing, this is my comment, that it will not be, for instance, frightfully dull, then. For what will one have to do when everything will be calculated and tabulated? But on the other hand, everything will be extraordinarily rational. Of course, boredom may lead you to anything. It is boredom sets one sticking golden pins into people. But all that would not matter. What is bad, this is my comment again, is that I dare say people will be thankful for the gold pins then. Man is stupid, you know, phenomenally stupid, or rather, he is not at all stupid, but he is so ungrateful that you could not find another like him in all creation. I, for instance, would not be in the least surprised if all of a sudden, apropos of nothing, in the midst of general prosperity, a gentleman with an ignoble, or rather with a reactionary and ironical, countenance were to arise, and, putting his arms akimbo, say to us all, I say, gentlemen, hadn't we better kick over the whole show and scatter rationalism to the winds, simply to send these logarithms to the devil, and to enable us to live once more at our own sweet foolish will? That again would not matter, but what is annoying is that he would be sure to find followers. Such is the nature of man and all that for the most foolish reason, which, one would think, was hardly worth mentioning, that is, that man everywhere and at all times, whoever he may be, has preferred to act as he chose, and not in the least as his reason and advantage dictated. And one may choose what is contrary to one's own interests, and sometimes one positively ought. That is my idea one's own free, unfettered choice, one's own caprice, however wild it may be, one's own fancy worked up at times to frenzy, is that very most advantageous advantage which we have overlooked, which comes under no classification and against which all systems and theories are continually being shattered to atoms. And how do these wiseacres know that man wants a normal, a virtuous choice? What has made them conceive that man must want a rationally advantageous choice? What man wants is simply independent choice, whatever that independence may cost and wherever it may lead. And choice, of course, the devil only knows what choice. 
End of chapter 7